Hey guys, it's Drake, and uh, today this video will, I think, only tangentially be about um, the books I normally talk about. Uh, I've just been thinking a lot about kind of the question behind why I read what I read, like trying to figure things out, trying to figure out what's going on in the world and what led up to what's going on in the world today. And it's led me to think about the education system, which I have a daily interaction with. And it's also made me consider how my own family uh, interacted with world history. And that'll make more sense as I get into it. But a lot of, you know, when I look back and try to figure out like, well, why, really, why do I read? It really comes down to, since I can remember, I've just loved learning about history. Like literally since like the age of five, I've just loved history. And of course, history is just a bunch of really interesting stories. That's all history is. So people who say they don't like history, they, they don't know what they're saying. They either do like history and they have a distorted view about it, or they're just a completely boring person and they just don't like stories, which uh, I generally think mo the majority of people fall into the first category, like in their head, history means like 1847 or, you know, 1776 somehow like picking the right box on a quiz is history which would be the fault of their teachers and their parents up to a certain age up to a certain age then it's their fault but you know younger kids you hear them say that oh, i don't like history or whatever that's just because they've had bad education but for me i can't even imagine not caring about history i genuinely cannot imagine it so that gives me a pretty serious difficulty in understanding why other people don't like history in a certain way or don't find it interesting or don't care to learn more about it. I really just have a complete disconnect there where I just have to take their word for it that it's not interesting, but I cannot imagine, like, I cannot imagine a reality where history is not interesting. So, that leads into like the overall idea of what I've been trying to think about is I've really try, been trying to figure out World War I as a hinge point in like global history because, uh, and some of this thinking comes actually from uh, me and some of the people in the Discord that is associated with this YouTube channel we're talking about, you know, like virtue ethics and, um, you know, the malaise of the modern world, maybe as a way to put it, you know, the decline in Christianity and things like that. And apart from that, I've been interested in modernism since I really got interested in literature deeply. I've been interested in history 10 years longer than I've been interested in like good literature. But my interest in history really allowed me to skip over a lot of BS with my interest in literature. And when I really got it down into literature, I really honed in on the modernist period. So anywhere from, I, I justifiably like the heart of modernism is 1900 to 1950. You can maybe squeeze 10 years before, before and after that, but really the heart is that, like when, when someone says modernism, 1900 to 1950. Now, the less common idea is that I think we're in, in no meaningful way are we beyond modernism, either its concerns, its artistic techniques, its uh, historical scope, 
its view on the world necessarily. And that's a different point. But I think one of the reasons I was so interested in modernism is the modernist period was really the first time in world history that if you were like plugged into intellectual culture, you know, you could read and you were, you had, you know, a certain amount of time to be able to, to read books and think about things. You had such a large scope on all of human affairs that no single person could have ever had up to that point. But with that being said, it's kind of that distinction I think about between like, the politicians at the time and the greatest thinkers of the time. And it really draws a distinction for me when I think about, uh, you know, like Dwight Eisenhower and John von Neumann, which have their overlaps, oddly enough, in certain ways. But, you know, or like Lyndon B. Johnson and uh, Richard Feynman, you know, who again have kind of like weird overlaps in certain ways, but just thinking about those, like, wait a minute, this, this is the guy that is in charge of the U S Lyndon B. Johnson is in charge of the U S wait a minute. Is that the best we could find? Is that really the best we could find? That's the direction I think about it. And then when you think back in the modernist period, you have the artists, the scientists, the philosophers, uh, the, you know, kind of polymath types like Rabindranath Tagore or, you know, just name them off, name them off. And you contrast that with the like brain dead stupidity of World War One. And, you know, I was kind of trying to think of an analogy for this in my head. And I think, although it, I, it puts too fine of a point on it, World War I is really like, uh, it's humanity as a three-year-old child discovering a gun and accidentally killing their brother with it. Not knowing what a gun is. You know, they just discover this gun, oh wow, what's this? And they accidentally pull the trigger and boom, they uh, kill their brother and then they just have to live with it the rest of their life. They being humanity and we just have to live with like what we've done for the rest of our, uh, you know, cultural lives. And in a very deep way, World War II is basically indistinguishable from World War I because uh, oddly enough, one of my students um, had an unusual last name, unusual in the sense that I didn't know how to say it correctly. So I asked, oh, how do you say your last name? And it turns out it's an Armenian last name. And uh, partially just my general interest in things, but also partially because I've been so interested in learning about the uh, background of World War I, my student began talking about um, the current struggle with Armenia between uh, this war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, which really I don't think I've heard a single person talk about, which is always disappointing. But of course, you can't think about Armenian history and not think about the Armenian genocide, which also pretty much uh, no one talks about. Even though it was an extreme like, like wake up call as a precursor to what you'd see in the Holocaust. And I asked my student, I just said, hey, can you give me some, you know, Armenian recommendations? Their father is a, Arme he's the Armenian in the family. And my student recommended me a book that I had been meaning to read for years, years and years. Uh, 40 Days of Mus Musadag, I don't know how to say that exactly, uh, by Franz Verfo, the, uh, early 20th century writer. I had read a book by him before, uh, Pale Blue Ink in a Lady's Hand, which is just kind of an interesting kind of throwaway, almost like Stefan Zweig kind of feeling to it. 
not that all of his books are that way, but it kind of gives you this cosmopolitan Europe uh, feeling. Um, Letter from an Unknown Woman is the Stefan Schweig that I connected to, but even though it's different, it's different, but I, they, they feel the same. And so uh, since my student recommended that book, I thought, well, screw it. And actually at that time that my student recommended, I had it in my, my cart to purchase anyway. So I was like, why not? Just buy it. So uh, long story short, I have it now. And um, I'm, I'm definitely going to read it. But the connection there is that Franz Werfel wrote it in 1933. You know, he saw the parallels very clearly and even intuitively uh, he saw them. And then, of course, very quickly after, he saw the direct, you know, declarative parallels between the Armenian genocide and the um, genocide that was being inflicted on European Jewish population. And so that gets me to my other point, connecting back to education, that To learn, to understand the Holocaust, you have to understand the Armenian Genocide. To understand the Armenian Genocide, you have to understand what led to World War I and what was going on with the Ottoman Empire. To understand World War I, you have to understand the world system of the time. You have to understand the history of the British Empire. You have to understand the history of the German Confederation. You have to understand the Habsburg Empire and the Austro-Hungarians. You have to understand, uh, like I said, the Ottoman Empire. You have to understand the Russian Empire. To understand each of those, you would have to do an immense amount of research but, you know, going back to, to understand the Russian Empire, you would have to look at its expansion across Siberia and the, the extreme parallels between that expansion across Siberia and the expansion of the United States West. The United States, in a less compact way, genocided the natives in the Western United States. Russia, especially when you look at like the Circassian genocide, genocided its uh, native population to the east, and then Siberians and so on. And that was pretty compact in certain, certain years for the Circassian genocide. And then to understand the Ottomans, you have to go back to the 1300s. And you have to see, okay, uh, in, in a novel Islamic empire that starts, takes over a lot of land and economic power and trade routes and different things. Okay, what were they pushing up against? They were pushing up against the Byzantines, Byzantine empire to the west, and then the Safavid uh, Persians to the east. The Safavid Persians were also an Islamic empire. To their east were the Mughals. That brings us back to the British Empire. And, uh, you know, European colonialism, Spain, Portugal, especially Portugal, the Netherlands, going over to India. Britain eventually totally conquers India. I think, you know, without taking India, Britain would, would be nowhere as strong as it was nowhere is dominant in the 1800s. So Britain bangs up against the Mughal dynasty and empire. And then the massive growth of Europe during the you know, 1500 to 1700. It had to do with, uh, you know, technology of exploration, uh, you know, metalwork. And a lot of that comes from 
scientific practices rediscovered through the Islamic Golden Age, funneling through places like Italy and Spain, chiefly. And then you do have some interplay in the, the Byzantine Empire. But chiefly, you have the... Um, you have the 12th century renaissance of translations coming out from uh, Spain, Sephardic Jews, uh, you know, and so on. And then you have the massive influence of the Islamic Golden Age culture on Sicily and southern Italy, which that's what I've been meaning to look more into. You have... Uh, Sicily was heavily influenced by Islamic culture. Well, where does the modern, really the modern literary tradition come from? Dante, where was he? Who was he influenced by? He was influenced by Sicilian court poets. Just his one generation before him, who was in control of Italy and then the Holy Roman Empire during Dante's time, Frederick II. And uh, it just, you know, it just magnifies back. And then, okay, to understand the Renaissance, which is a rebirth of classical civilization, the Romans and the Greeks, who were both heavily imperial powers or areas, you have to go back to, okay, the Romans. And then you have to go to, you know, Charlemagne, the Holy Roman Empire, in inspired out of Rome. And the Greeks going all the way, Alexander the Great going over and taking over the uh, uh, the Persians, the different Persian Empire. And uh, you start to see the same patterns, though, where in one of the like thought experiments I had is, you know, what would have happened in the Crusades? if they had had nuclear bombs and machine guns. I don't think it would have looked much different than World War I. And so, one point I want to make about education, at least in the United States, but I think you can pretty much draw it everywhere. Education, modern education, is completely insufficient to understand pretty much anything. To have any idea of the scope of history, of human endeavor, of achievement, and of failure of humanity, modern day education is completely insufficient and almost like laughably insufficient. You know, I got an English degree and a partial, you know, a minor degree in education. Pretty much everything I know, I had to teach myself as far as uh, connecting history to literature and literature to science and mathematics and things like that. I would have never gotten that out of education. I didn't ever get that out of education. Of course, I was in some ways given the time to, th to write and think about things, but it was usually in kind of an idiotic way, like... I distinctly remember in high school, just kind of like counting the times that my history teacher was incorrect about kind of trivial facts even. And of course, everyone gets facts incorrect. But sometimes, you know, I, you know, I often catch myself missing a date here, missing a date there. But eventually the facts add up to leading to a completely incorrect analysis of something, you know, not to go to it too deeply, but that's why Oswald Spangler is just like, almost a laughing stock to me. He gets so many things wrong, it's just unbelievable. You know, from his from his perspective, uh, you know, imagining it as someone writing in the early 1920s, late 19 teens. He gets so many things wrong. Anyway, that's a uh, digression. But I think that, I don't know the solution of modern education, but if we have any hope, we have to raise the standards. If we have any hope of figuring out these extremely deep problems that we have 
faced in like civilization deep problems. We have to raise the standards. We can't just hope that private school kids save us. And, or homeschooled kids. We can't just hope that they'll save us. I don't like the odds there. If the majority of people are going through a brain dead system, the odds of making it out of this, whatever this is, are slim. Because if I had an education that showed me in any way, like literally in any way, even if it was mentioned in a class, drawn out for me, the connection between linguistics and history and thought, just that alone, seeing, seeing the connection between Bantu languages and mythology, Sino-Tibetan languages and their and mythology, Indo-European languages, mythology and poetics, uh, Uto-Aztecan languages and mythology, and so on. And how those influences span so deeply into the past and into the present. That alone, as like a way of thinking about life, is huge to me. And while you get kind of like a, like an idiotic watered down version where, Oh, James Joyce referenced Homer. Who did Homer reference? Homer referenced the Hittites. And then who did they reference? They referenced the, the Mesopotamians, the Sumerians. Just that, just that broadening of a perspective. And then when you hear the Renaissance described, I have never heard of a description of the Renaissance, apart from maybe in a history of modern science class I took in university, talk about the extreme connection between the Islamic Golden Age and the European Renaissance. Like without the Islamic Golden Age, you don't get the European Renaissance. It's that simple. And of course, without Byzantine Empire and classical civilization, you don't get the Islamic Golden Age, whatever. And influences from India as well. You, because generally you're in school, in public school in the United States, and I think you can generally broaden this out to European education systems and the vast majority of private schools and homeschooling, you get you get a version of history that you know when you when you look at pictures of the asteroid belt, you imagine that It's, it's just filled with asteroids, right? Like it, you just couldn't get through it. If you flew in an airplane through the asteroid belt, you couldn't get through it. But it's actually so spaced out apart that statistically asteroids never collide. You know, they do, but it's so rare that it just would never happen. And I think that's our education system. We imagine that, oh, we fill kids with information every day. Oh my God, you know, 1776, 1848, you know, 1914, all these dates. Oh, connect this year, 1914, World War One, Civil War. Oh, look, it all comes together. We imagine that it's filled and, oh, I couldn't imagine how I could fit anything else. But in reality, it's the asteroid belt. None of these facts or pieces of information or ideas or patterns connect to anything else. You know, I wonder how many students could genuinely say, why am I, why are you learning history? Who, how many students could answer that? 
And one thing I can say uh, for me is that this has frustrated me so badly that it has changed how I teach. Of course, I don't want to be the teacher that I had. I don't want to be the vast majority of teachers that I had. I would be disgusted with myself. So often I think to myself, why am I teaching this and why does it matter? And if I can tell myself that this doesn't matter, I won't teach it. Of course, within reason, sometimes just practically, you know, the authoritarian nature of our education system, lack of trust in teachers, etc. You do have to teach some things that are just unbelievably idiotic and you just have to, you know, buckle up and do it. Otherwise you'll encounter so many difficulties. You won't be able to teach what you want or what you think you should be able to. But that being said, many of the people who become teachers were, were good students, meaning that they ate up the current system that is completely insufficient. So their idea of what is sufficient is completely insufficient. And that's part of what I notice I'm surrounded by uh, as an education profession, not necessarily at my school. I do have some, some you know, really top quality peers at my school, but even in my uh, university program, uh, at, uh, the university I graduated from, completely insufficient, just like hilarious, hilarious that it's the best teaching program in my state, state of Texas, right? 30 million people, population of Canada, horrifyingly low standards for educators. And... Um, that leads me into my other point I wanted to make, just a little brief point, I think. Um, actually, okay, a couple books. I, I did grab a couple books. So, one, the one book I've been reading and I'm almost finished with and I'm loving it, Carpenter's Gothic. And I do look, because I was so poorly educated formally, um, I did rely heavily on people like William Gaddis to like, like, how should I educate myself? Basically, you know, I, I fell in love with Goethe early on. Um, I really liked, uh, David Hume, John Keats, Chaucer early on. That's like when I was 17, 18, Cormac McCarthy, Gaddis came a little later. Uh, Dostoevsky really liked Dostoevsky. And then, as time went on a little bit, I really uh, got into uh, Gaddis. And I think Gaddis really helped me get on this path. Gaddis and James Joyce, I think, were the two that really made me think about, well, where is all this coming from, really? Where, where is all of this coming from? You know, this is in quotations and italicized. Where is all of this coming from? And Gaddis, of course, with the recognitions, the Golden Bow by Fraser origins of Christianity with Mithraism and so on. You know, this idea, thank God there was the goal to forge, forge and forge, both meanings of the word. But reading Carpenter's Gothic now, um, I just got through a section where, uh, is it, Liz, yeah, Liz's brother and McCandless are talking, it's near the end. And they're discussing Reverend Ude and Paul. Paul is Liz's husband. Reverend Ude is the uh, evangelist preacher that Paul is working for. They're in, they're, they have a mission in Africa to um, collect souls for, for Odin or the, the Christian God. And uh, Liz's brother is basically completely shitting on Reverend Yude and Paul and this kind of whole industry of, you know, this evangelism and neo-colonialism of Africa and so on. And he goes through the history of different African countries and the horrible contemporary state of them after, you know, like literal colonialism was going on that led into World War One. 
So that's kind of been one, one uh, center of gravity of my thinking is this book. And I do have a book that I'm actually looking at right in front of me uh, that came after, I mean, the events in this came after Gaddis was writing uh, Africa's World War, which is about the war in the Congo, the Rwandan genocide, and the making of a continental catastrophe. And I was kind of amazed to find out that Gaddis was writing about this general like buildup of a catastrophe in Africa before it actually happened. So highly, highly recommend Carpenter's Gothic. Of course, it's excellent, of course, but just excellent. I'm, I'm like thrilled. I almost don't even want to finish it because I'm just loving it so much, but I am going to finish it. And then, um, researching the British Empire. I, I was really fascinated by the idea of Britain around the time of Milton to Newton. So 1650 to 1750, you know, give or take. I know that's not their exact dates, but that's the time period I was interested in. Because 1650, you have the English Civil War, which is really kind of a fascinating completely crazy time. You have the 30 years war that's happening on the continent a little before that, but in, into that time. And then you have the uh, like scientific revolution that happens. So Galileo, Milton met Galileo, one of those unbelievable situations in history. Galileo leads into Newton. You have Christian Huygens, so on and so on. London was really the center of technology and science in the late 1600s, early 1700s. Um, one kind of weird connection is uh, a bunch of guys in the Discord are obsessed with watches. I don't give a fuck about watches, honestly, but I was looking into... Uh, pocket watches of the late 1600s and it's fascinating I'm not going to go into it now but the pocket watch is a really good symbol of what was going on in the UK well not at the time England at the time in the early 1700s late 1600s London made the best watches at the time they also had the best scientists at the time, Newton. And their empire was expanding massively at the time as well. Of course, colonialism in America and so on that eventually leads into American Revolution and things like that at the end of the century, the 1700s. But when I learn about a time in history, I really prefer to learn about it through an exceptional person. Because I really feel like an exceptional person will touch on so many unusual facets of a time period that if you pick the right person, you can learn very, very deeply about a time period, especially if you have a good biography. So that being said, um, I decided Alexander Pope was my guy. Apart from Newton, I've already read uh, Never at Rest, which is a biography of Newton, exceptional biography of uh, Isaac Newton, just perfect, everything you'd wish for in a biography. But I wanted to get an, another perspective, and I use this as an excuse also to read Alexander Pope, which I've never liked his style, but I've noticed as time goes on, I, I'm getting better at better at um, kind of, uh, I don't know, how would you, how would you say it? Uh, imagining I'm alive in the time that I'm reading not reading now, but to give you an example, when I'm reading Alexander Pope, let's say he published a book in 1728, I imagine that I'm alive in 1728. And I'm better able to understand exactly what he's saying. Not in, not in a trivial way where, like, oh, they didn't have cell phones back then, I'd act like I don't have cell phones. But just... 
you know, having a really deep knowledge of history helps, which I'm working on. But just being able to imagine what what would I be thinking about if I'm sitting in a coffee house in London in 1728? I have my, you know, I'm an aristocrat, whatever. I'm able to read. Uh, I have my pocket watch in my pocket that costs me the equivalent of a car in modern day terms. And I have Alexander Pope's new uh, version of the Dunciad. You know, I smell smoke in the air, smoking tobacco or whatever. Some people have tea in the corner. I'm drinking coffee. What does it smell like in the, in the coffee house? Who else is talking? What accent do they have? And then apart from all those things, which maybe is 10, 15% of it, what would I be thinking about if I was alive in that time? What would my perspective be on what I'm reading? And of course, you do that intuitively when you read. Of course you have to do that. You can't understand anything before your own time if you don't do that. But I think I've just become much more methodical about it. Like, reading facsimiles helps. If it's modernized spelling, you miss out on so much character. And it's really about the character of the, of the work. But anyway, so I've been, I've been able to uh, appreciate Alexander Pope a lot more. And uh, that being said as well, I have another book that I'm using to get into this uh, research. Um, a Great and Monstrous Thing, London in the 18th Century. So London in this time was really the, the center of the world, um, literally, I think you could say. And so this book is excellent, published by Harvard University Press. Uh, quotes Daniel Defoe in the beginning, talks about James Gibbs, uh, Samuel Johnson, uh, talks about, uh, who else would you know, Eliza Haywood, what else? Uh, the Fieldings, Henry Fielding, sis his sister, and uh, John Wilkes. So anyway, um, learning about the British Empire more, and I think it's really helping me kind of get a grasp on World War I and uh, everything leading up to it. Um, someone mentioned I need to look more into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which is an excellent recommendation. I absolutely do need to. Um, I think for now though, apart from everything else <laughs> I'm, I'm researching, um, my two areas that I really need to learn a lot more about to help me understand the way of the world right now is I do need to learn more about the British from, I'd say rough estimate 1550, let's say 1550 to, you know, 1900, I guess, if we're looking at World War I, but, you know, to the present in a way, decolonialization and stuff that happened under Elizabeth II. I guess from Elizabeth to Elizabeth, right? Yeah. And uh, in the Ottoman Empire. I heard someone describe the Ottoman Empire as the closest to the American Empire right now. And I suppose that is one thing about being, uh, you know, being alive and this time that I am is uh, we're, we're witnessing one of the great world empires um, decline. And of course, some declines don't end completely at the bottom. You can decline for a certain amount of time and then rise again and so on. But yeah, it seems completely obvious that the United States is in a really bad spot possibly even looking at some sort of uh, civil conflict, which uh, should be avoided at all costs, really, but I don't think it will be. And, you know, you see what's going on in Russia and things like that. It doesn't give you hope. But I think learning about the Ottoman Empire, how that collapsed, which adding in a ton of information and details, the collapse of the Ottomans opened up the vacuum that led to the modern Middle East. And the modern Middle East is a whole ridiculous, like black hole 
of, you know, I don't even know, even if you learned Arabic, if you could figure it out. There's so many ideologies competing and anyway, but yeah, if you're wondering, this is uh, Paul Ceylon's ear, one of his books. <laughs> Maybe that's what I'll end on, Paul Ceylon's ear. But uh, yeah, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things I've been interested in and you know, I do really wonder what's the point of learning all this? What's the point of learning all uh, about these empires and stuff? I'm, I never want to be in politics. I don't want to be an advisor to anybody. That's one thing I do think about too. Like, even if you do have the intellect to uh, do these things, um, do you have to, should you? It's always a question. Just because you can, should you? Just because you can design a nuclear bomb, should you do it? You know? I've been thinking about that a lot too with uh, World War I and things. Just because Fritz Haber had the ability to design, you know, chlorine gas and Zyklon B and things like that and um, artificial nitrogen, should he have? Or should he have written a novel? I don't know. And just if you have the ability to write a novel, should you? I think back on uh, Paul Valeri's idea right here Paul Valeri's idea that the best writer will never write and uh, it's not a not a trivial consideration it's probably a deeper phrase than it seems the best writer will have never written and they're not the best because they didn't write it's the other way around because they're the best writer they never wrote And uh, yeah, screw it, I'll throw in another interesting book I got recently. Uh, Two Plays of Weimar Germany, Youth is a Sickness and Criminals. Um, this is uh, Ferdinand Bruckner. And one thing I was really interested in with this is how it overlaps with um, The Man Without Qualities. Because Youth is a Sickness, I'm just reading off the back, I haven't read them yet. Youth is a Sickness explores the lives of Germany's lost generation, those who grew up during and after the cataclysm of the First World War, devoid of hope and ideals, lost in a haze of sex and drugs. That was 1924. And then 1926, you have Criminals, traces several court cases about a failed double suicide, theft, abortion, and homosexual blackmail. Controversial topics for its time and even today. It's innovative staging and interwoven storylines, blah, blah, blah. So I think if you are familiar with Robert Musil, you will notice some ex like very strong parallels between what uh, these plays are talking about and what Musil talks about. And screw it, I'm just showing books at this point, but Theater Symptoms by Robert Musil, his writings on plays, his commentary, on it and his own plays. And this was uh, translated with an introduction by Janice Grill. I, I think that's how you say the name. G-E-N-E-S-E -E -E, and then Grill. So um, I didn't look to see if he talks about, I would assume he talks about uh, Bruckner in there at some point. Let me see, not obvious. He does talk about Schnitzler dream story and his plays and so on. Franz Werfel, talks about Franz Werfel, interesting. Yeah, but, and the Utopians, the Utopians is fascinating, a Musil's play. But uh, yeah, anyway, hopefully if you listen to this, hopefully it was worth diverging from mostly books and kind of more uh, parochial concerns. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing I meant to talk about. Well, you know, thinking about all this large scale kind of stuff, it's easy to forget that like real actual people lived in these times, apart from artists and politicians and thinkers and stuff. Because my great grandma was born in 1918. And, um, you know, she lived in Kentucky, you know, 
people look back and think, oh, 1920s in America, that's Great Gatsby. Great Gatsby didn't exist for 95% of Americans in any way, in any way at all. And that's what I think can be a difficulty when you look back at history. You end up looking at history through the thinkers and the intellectuals and the, soul and the generals and the politicians and the historians. And up until, you know, even being somewhat generous, up until 1850, there was not a single poor historian. <laughs> You know, so it's like you're getting a very slim perspective. And based on that slim perspective, you have to build the whole, the fullness of history and life up to today. And I was thinking that, uh, you know, my great grandma born in 1918 in Kentucky. The Great Depression really didn't mean much to her in the sense of losing money, it just meant that everyone around her was much worse off as well. Now, it did affect her in the sense that, you know, she saved and things like that, kind of a, a typical thing that you would imagine from that time, but it wasn't the crash, you know, of Black Friday or the, or no, Black Tuesday, Black Tuesday. It wasn't that, it wasn't that for her. It was just, of course she was young at that time, 10 years old, 11 years old, but it's just when you look at history from the perspective of, you know, a normal person, everything becomes much less obvious. And things are already com complex as it is and everything becomes much less obvious because, you know, my grandma, great-grandma 1918 when she was 22 in 1940 you know just think about what she could have been reading she could have been reading <laughs> Ulysses she could have been educated on Albert Einstein and all this stuff I actually calculated and some of my relatives were in uh, Illinois in 1949 and theoretically they could have run into John von Neumann when he gave a lecture at the University of Illinois and that's like hilarious to think about. But um, anyway, this video has gone on much too long. So if you made it this far, hope you enjoyed. Uh, yeah, let me know if there's anything that I should be looking into that I'm not. And uh, my next videos will be about books, return to normal uh, programming. All right, death is a gang boss.